playoffs, but uh, <laughs> but we're not. We're in uh, Western Washington, so it's a little bit different. But um, but uh, thank you for those who joined online. We did have a few folks here, and that was a blessing. And uh, lots of work. Uh, you probably can't see it. Most of the mess has been cleaned up, but lots of work going on. We are making good progress on the remodel of the offices. Uh, we're a little bit delayed on the plumbing for obvious reasons, like all the plumbers in the county were out trying to unfreeze uh, pipes this week. So we're a little bit behind on that, but that should get caught up this week. And I think the electrical is nearing completion, and then it's uh, drywall. And, and, and uh, so uh, continue to pray for that. Uh, thank you for your patience during some of the uh, stuff. If you don't know where the offices are at, um, just holler, just stand in the hallway and say help and somebody will come running out of somewhere but, uh, but they're just a little bit out of pocket right now but uh, praise the Lord that we're able to get those things done and for the work that was done we also had, we also had um, a crew of people in this week and uh, they, uh, there'll be some either tomorrow or Tuesday finishing up putting in our security camera system uh, so that we can have record of that. Now remember that our purpose, of course, is to some degree the security of the building. We are interested in that. Uh, but it's, it's also, and our real reason for going down that road was the protection of our children, giving observation in the classrooms uh, to how our children are being cared for. So, uh, so that there's never a time that uh, someone who would mean to do uh, the wrong thing would have liberty to do the wrong thing. We're concerned uh, to the point of, uh, of uh, passion about the care of our children while they're in our children's ministry. So, uh, so I'm just thankful. Maybe I'm giving you a report. I don't know. Uh, but I'm thankful for all that has gone on this week. And I'm thankful for your patience in all of that and in some of the last minute changes. And uh, we will, we will uh, always minimize those, but sometimes uh, we have some constraints that require some flexibility. So uh, thank you very much for that. I want you to take your Bibles this morning, if you would, and open the book of Exodus and chapter number 40. Exodus chapter number 40, and that really will be our starting text this morning and our ending text, and I'm going to have you visit a couple of other places with me as we go, but we'll get to them. But Exodus chapter number 40, and when you find your place, if you would uh, stand in honor of the Word of God with me this morning, uh, that would be a great blessing. Exodus chapter number 40. We're only going to read a few verses. We're going to begin to read in verse 34 this morning, that last kind of paragraph of this uh, great book. Exodus chapter number 40, beginning in verse number 34. The Bible says this, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the glory of because the cloud, pardon me, abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then uh, they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys." Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this time. And I know, Lord, that we step into this moment, the, the, just the critical time, I believe, in this day, when we would endeavor to lean forward in our seats and through your word hear from you. And that is our desire today, not to hear just from a man with a Bible, but to hear the Bible as your voice today that we would hear your call beckoning, beckoning us to draw nigh to you, that one that's here today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior would, would, uh, would just uh, see you so clearly that, that they could not help but to inquire of how they might uh, have everlasting life and be drawn nigh to you. And God, that you would be honored in this place. Honest glory would be uh, experienced by you and you would manifest that in our church and in our lives in this day. We're... We're excited and humbled to come before you. Lord, we want to be very reverent. And yet we want, Lord, to not miss a drop of what you have for us. So help us as we look in your word. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing and please be seated.
Let me give you a great introduction. We're here today for that. No, you, you just went like this. Preacher, have you lost your mind? Well, potentially, that was a long time ago. But um, did you notice what happened here? They completed the work that God gave them to do, the building of the tabernacle, according to the instruction of God. In fact, if you went back in the last uh, chapter here of the book of Exodus, chapter 40, and, and, uh, and, and you could see it right, just go back to verse 29 with me, and it says, And he put the altar of burnt offering by the door of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and offered, it upon, and offered upon it uh, the burnt offering and the meat offering, listen to this phrase, as the Lord commanded Moses. And so uh, what we have in the latter part of the book of Exodus is uh, God uh, having led the nation of Israel out of bondage in Egypt and, and uh, brought them uh, uh, through a number of things across the Red Sea. And they're now really preparing, they're at Mount Sinai here, and they're really preparing uh, to leave this place shortly and to go up to the promised land. It really just in a short time, they're going to come to a place called Kadesh Barnea, where it would have been God's intention for them at that moment to cross over into the promised land and to begin to, uh, to take it, to, uh, to deal with the Amalekites and the Canaanites that were in the land and to make that land that was promised to Israel their land. And so uh, we're really standing there. They've been at Mount Sinai now for a year or better. And really the great giving of the law all took place on Mount Sinai, didn't it? That's where Moses went up a couple of different times, 40 days and 40 nights, fasting before the Lord. And there he received the instructions of the law. Now, remember this, that the law was the terms of the covenant agreement between God and the nation of Israel. That's all that it was. It was, uh, it was the rule of law or rule of life for that uh, dispensation of time, but, but it was the words of the covenant. And so when we would see and read all those uh, all of those commandments some recorded here in exodus many in the book of leviticus those are the terms of how israel was to relate to god underneath this great mosaic covenant and they received all of that moses also received instruction on how to build the tabernacle uh, that we find uh, filling with the glory of god here well what's the big deal about a tabernacle well, here's the big deal. The tabernacle represented the place where Israel, mankind, and God came together. It was the place where God said, I will speak to you from off of this mercy seat in the most holies. And where they would come and offer both worship and sacrifice and offerings of atonement in their life. Now for us, all of that pictured the wonderful work of Jesus Christ that we experience all of the benefits of today if we've been born again. But that tabernacle was the picture of God with man. That's why the inner part where the mercy seat was and where we read about the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, that's in a place in the tabernacle called the most holy place. And what else would you call a place where God would abide? except the most holy place. And so they got those instructions. And when we get here to chapter 40 and just this paragraph that we read, what we're at is we're at the end of all of that. They have gone through the process of building the tabernacle. We won't do it this morning. It won't really help us in our message, but, but it, it would be interesting maybe for you to go back and read uh, the process of that building. And, and while it's not spoken in day-by-day -day terms, but the details and, the, and the, all that goes on is given very clearly by God. And they did it that way. So understand that the tabernacle, God's dwelling place amongst men at that time, that it was designed by God. That wasn't the creation of man. That God designed it and then said to Moses, Moses, I want you to do this this way. I want you to build this this way. I want this to look like this and this to look like this. I want this kind of material to be used in this instrument and this kind of material in this instrument. And here's what we read, that it was all done according as the Lord had commanded Moses now there was a result to that and it's what we're after see the result of finishing this work and doing it all according to the commandment that God gave them was that God began to manifest his glory 
Now, glory is a hard thing often to understand. But I want you to notice this, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and we'll come back and finish here. But, but I want you to notice that God's glory was something that was real and present in their life. And it was so thick or so, so present that Moses could not go into the tabernacle. This was the place where Moses would go and sit in the holy place, God uh, there with the veil between him and God in the most holy place, and God promised there and did give him instruction or spoke to him from there. Moses couldn't enter into this place because really the manifestation of the wonderful presence and glory of God was so thick, so present, so I know it's hard uh, perhaps to imagine, but, but when God manifests his glory, it's so powerful that, that he couldn't even enter into that place. This happened at another time in Scripture, didn't it? It happened maybe a couple of times, but we know when Solomon finished the first temple, dwelling place of God, that the glory of God filled that place in such a way that mankind couldn't enter in now listen we should not expect that today a smoke and fire substance or manifestation of the presence of God will fill this building to where you can't enter in in fact the smoke fills this building will have fire trucks outside from the alarm system But the manifestation of the glory of God is in our lives, and in our work, in the demonstration by how we live and worship and operate together of the very thick and heavy presence of God in our lives. Someone say hallelujah. And it's that that we want. We gather, we live, we serve, we worship, we seek God with all of our heart that we might see his glory now, I know that all of the talk and all of us understand this, that the chief end of man is to bring glory to God. That's just clearly what the Bible teaches us and what we believe, that, that we do exist uh, to bring glory to God. And we understand just from this simple thing that that really only happens when we do that God's way. See, we don't get to decide when God gets glory. Do you get that? I don't get to do this like, hey, listen, I went down to the church the other day and I found all the chairs were crooked and uh, so I straightened them all up and while I was there, I, I rearranged all of the hymnals because I think it works better and, you know, whatever. And I just did that and God got great glory. God might from that, but you and I don't decide. It's our job to seek the glory of God through living our lives and serving him according to his instructions. And I promise you that when God is glorified, that he can manifest that glory by the way he works in and through our lives. How many of you understand that today? And it really is God who decides when he's received glory from us. Amen? Now, it would be normal if you would think this morning, well, preacher, that all sounds good, but this whole concept of bringing glory to God is somewhat unclear to me. I don't understand what it means. I mean, what does it look like when, uh, when that happens? What, what is the glory of God? What is, how would it be manifest or seen in my life and in our church? Well, l let me back you up about a year. And, and let me take you back to, I don't know, December of uh, a year ago, uh, December. And I, and I preached a message to you on a Sunday night, I think, uh, about the, the, what is the glory of God? And I'm not going to re-preach that message this morning for those of you who remember it word for word, which is, I mean, never mind, probably none. But, but I want to remind you of what the glory of God is and something that, that I just call in the message the glory principle. In other words, the glory of God is not whatever we decide it is, right? It's what God says it is. And there are some elements to the glory of God that we find in Scripture. I'm not going to have you turn to all of these, but, but we do find these things in Scripture. And, and we, we find in Scripture, first of all, that uh, as we study Scripture, that the glory or the idea of glory is connected to great uh, abundance. Okay, in Genesis chapter 31, we find, uh, we find uh, uh, Jacob there, and uh, he's uh, with his wives, and uh, he's gotten very wealthy from his father, and his brothers-in-law were not help, help, uh, happy pardon me, about all the wealth. And so uh, what they said is, he has taken all of our father's glory. 
and indicating to us there amongst other places that when we speak of glory, the first thing kind of connected with the concept of glory is great abundance. And we find uh, that uh, in other places in Scripture. But just get this. We'll just put some pieces together. The number one thing that is, that is, that is a part of glory and uh, God's glory being manifest and really God being glorified is the idea of abundance, right? Uh, could I say it this way? Uh, <clears throat> glory doesn't trickle through a leak in the roof, that there's a lot of it, that there's a lot of whatever God is, there's a lot of holiness, maybe there's a lot of our obedience to Him, but, but glory indicates or, or requires abundance for glory uh, to be both offered and manifest. Here's the, another one. It refers to brightness and majesty. And there's a great picture of it in the book of Acts when the Apostle Paul uh, was walking that way. He wasn't the Apostle Paul then. He was Saul of Tarsus. And he was walking down the road from Jerusalem to Damascus. And if you remember that he was going to Damascus to imprison and persecute and kill Christians. And he's walking along the road there and, and uh, God met him on that road. Jesus met him on that road. And the way that Jesus manifest his presence was through a bright light. Now, they're there at midday, get this. It's noontime. They're walking down the road from Jerusalem to Damascus. Saul of Tarsus with a band of men, letters of authority from the uh, elders and leaders of Israel, and they got blood on their mind and probably a scowl on their face like, let's go get those Christians. And Jesus manifests his presence in a light that is so bright that it stopped them in their tracks. And, and Saul of Tarsus fell on his face and heard the voice that came from that light, the voice of Jesus Christ that said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He got up from that thing blinded. But in that moment, he said this, Lord, what would you have from me? Later when he recounts it, he says that he was stopped in that road by the brightness of, of the glory that that glory that bright shining light was so so intense that it stopped him in his tracks caused him to fall on his face and begin to acknowledge Jesus Christ as God and he got up from that and would become the Apostle Paul but understand that in the idea of glory there's not only abundance but there is brightness. In other words, glory can never be seen or offered or, or observed in secret. It can't really be seen in hiding that if God's getting glory, there's something being done that stands out. Let me tell you how much it stands out. It stands out in contrast to any background. Well, preacher, why do you say that? Here's why. Because the brightest part of the day is when yeah, and at that time, he's walking in the brightest part of the day, and there's a light so intense compared to all the light around it that it stopped him. I'm telling you, if this had been a double D cell, uh, you know, a flashlight, he wouldn't have even noticed. This was light so bright and so intense that its source had to be and its purpose had to be something that other than just lighting because it stood out. This is an amazing thought. It stood out in contrast to full daylight. And understand this glory principle that if glory is offered, experienced, or observed, there's the idea or the necessity of some sort of abundance, and there is brightness or majesty associated with it. You can't miss that when God manifests His glory. Right? Here's the third thing. It also has the idea of dignity, of weightiness, really of a kind of a special, a set at another level, almost a one of a kindness and we read of it or learn of it in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, where it describes Jesus uh, as coming and manifest himself. And this is what it says of Jesus in John 1 and verse 14. And we beheld his glory, dignity, weight, value, uniqueness, as of the only begotten of the Father. John writes and says, we recognized him for who he was. 
He was the only begotten Son. He was God the Son. He was God manifest in the flesh. And we beheld that, that which only really belongs to God, that dignity and honor and weight and even majesty again. And so understand that when the Bible talks about glory, it's always talking about really those things that come together that, uh, that both are offered and that are manifest in God's glory. And, and, and they have to do with abundance, right? And, and with brightness or majesty and, uh, that stands out against any background or contrast and with weight or dignity, that which is of great value and honorable amongst all who observe it, the glory principle in Scripture. And so it tells us in that idea, in 1 Corinthians, this whole passage, but it tells us how God's glory can be seen from and in our lives. And it says this, and I'll, again, quickly, I want to get back to the book of Exodus, but, but it says this, listen, if God's glory is going to be seen in our life, it first of all has to be observable. It has to be in our body. Do you understand that? Hey, you may say, well, preacher, duh. No, no, not always duh, because a lot of people say, I'm just glorifying God in my heart, but would you understand that it's impossible for me to sit in a dark room and honestly bring honor or glory to God? I could worship God, I could praise God, but the idea of bringing Him glory, of Him standing apart and being seen for who He is really will never happen except it happen in the works and deeds of my body. Do you understand that? I can profess that what I'm doing is for the glory of God, but if what I do doesn't uh, really uh, live up to this principle of majesty and of uh, abundance and of uh, brightness and of dignity, then the truth is, is I don't. It has to be done in our body, that we have to show God's importance in our body. If we're going to live lives that bring glory to God, that we, uh, that, we need to, uh, that we need to do it right now. Not only do we need to do it in our body or before men, but we need to do it now. Today is the day that we glorify God with our life. Not later down the road, not when we retire, not when we get to be old. Uh, today is the day. I'm just going to get this out of the way. I don't know what will happen, but I know some of you are going to enjoy it. Then I'm going to get your attention back and we'll finish preaching. My wife and I looked at a house that we actually liked yesterday. It was in a 55 and up community. <laughs> see, I knew that would be the. Hey, listen to this. We're going to put in a waiver to see if they'll let us in at our age, you know. <laughs> okay, focus. The glory of God has to be before men, but it has to be now. If I'm not bringing glory to God now, then what is my life doing now for the sake of Christ and the glory? No, nothing. So it has to be done in my body. It has to be done now. It's in the present. Uh, listen, the glory of God, if it's going to be manifest in my life, that must be manifest in the routine things. In other words, everything that I do is about bringing glory to God, and so it must sort of live up to that those glory principle. Everybody get this? Of brightness and majesty and abundance and dignity and honor that I'm operating that way in my life. Why? Well, because I, I have to do it in the routine things. In fact, the Bible says it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, finish the verse for me, church, do all to the glory of God. The most routine things of life are to be about glorifying God from the life of a believer. And it has to be there. If all I do is live my life for me and not for the glory of God in this part, but I come to church on Sundays, I have one of those big, really uh, nice-looking hats with fruit on it, and I don't know, and I sing uh, with a really uh, loud voice so everyone can hear me and go like, wow, I wish he wouldn't sing so loud. And uh, uh, if that's what I think is bringing glory to God and yet the rest of my life has no consideration of God, there is no glory to God. It has to be in the routine things. It has to be in how I deal with my wife when you're not there. How I deal with the people when I'm driving down the road who get in front of my big truck like they want to commit suicide. How I deal with them because it's in the most routine things. When I sit at the restaurant and I need more water in my cup, the way I deal with that God demands that that would bring this brightness and abundance and dignity through my life to him in the most routine things. 
And in order to do all of that, 1 Corinthians says that I have to realize that I am not my own master, but that I am a servant of the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's the principle of glory. And it is what we're aiming at, but we find it in Exodus. We find that that everything came together and we see all of those things. We see abundance. The glory of God, the cloud was so thick, there was so much of it that they couldn't enter into the tabernacle. And then the the pillar of fire was so bright that it was seen and the glory by everyone all time during their journey, even in the most routine moment. Do you know that when Israel was sleeping in their tents camped, that the glory of God was emanating from that place? The most routine things, the brightness and majesty and dignity and glory of God was manifest in their life. And that's what we're after. We all say it. Well, we just want to live our lives for the glory of God. Well, that's what we're after everybody clear so far so how did they get there how did they get to the place and what does this have to do with missions well in the book of exodus i want you to turn back a few chapters because i want to look at what they did quickly to understand how they got to exodus chapter 40 so go back with me to exodus chapter 31 In Exodus chapter 31, God is giving the instructions for the building of this temple and who's to do it and how and when to Moses. In Exodus chapter 31, verse one, the Bible says this, and the Lord spake unto Moses saying, see I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. And so watch how this worked. God, whose glory is to be manifest, really manifests his glory on Mount Sinai. The fire and the cloud by day and by night were there. And he calls Moses up into them and says, Moses, let me tell you what I want so that through your life and through this nation, my glory will still be manifest. And I'm going to give you the responsibility to put the workers together to get it done. How many of you know this, that the nation of Israel was not a, uh, a, a something, and the work of the temple was not something that could just be done or not done, but that God put in it or in place a leader to make sure that it got done, to make sure they had the instructions and to make sure that the people were in their right place and that the work got done according to God's instruction. And that leader was Moses. And can I tell you this, that the truth of the matter is, is that no, no institution, no body, no church, really no family can ever come to the point where it consistently through their lives brings glory to God without somebody having to be the one that's, that's the leader. Now, not, not a dictator, not a despot, uh, not a potentate, uh, not a king, uh, none of those things, simply the leader. And the role of a, of, a, of a spiritual leader is both to hear from God and to take those things and to give them to others. Now, he's not the only one that hears from God. He's not the only one enabled by God. We'll see that. But his role is to hear from God and say, that's where God wants us to go. Come on, y'all, let's go. And it always requires leadership under God now please get this right leadership under God not leadership beside God or not leadership for God leadership under God but for God to get glory from our church it just like there will require leadership under God now you say well preacher are you tooting your own horn here I hope not my horn is rusty and out of tune I just know that God has a plan and a program and he has a structure that he has put in place for us to operate on and and what do we have we have homes with leadership in them don't we there's spiritual leadership in every home even if it's not always where it would best be and I understand that that we as uh, men and husbands have a role of spiritual leadership that is different than our wives it's not that theirs is less it's different And if we're not executing that, it's very difficult for our home to demonstrate the glory of God. There's always leadership under God. What do I mean by under, Matthew? I mean submitted to God, don't I? 
Not lifting itself up and saying, I'm the king and leader here, and you'll do what I say or I'm going to throw you out of the parking lot. That's not the kind of leadership that's under God. The kind of leadership that's under God is shepherding leadership, isn't it? Walking with the flock and bringing them along and feeding them on still pastures and uh, green pastures and still water so that the sheep grow and they know his voice and they follow him. But there will always be leadership under God. The second thing that we find here in Exodus chapter 31 is we find that there are people who are given some very clear talents and abilities by God. When you look, I'm sorry, chapter 35, go there with me. It says that he had called Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, and the tribe of Judah, but, but there is always that. Go to chapter 35 of Exodus and, uh, and uh, verse uh, number two. Well, let's start at verse one. In verse number one, it says this, And Moses gathered all the congregations of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded that ye should do them. So let me pause here and make a quick connection. We'll be done in just a few minutes with this part of the service. But um, So we had Moses receive the instruction from God. There's always leadership under God. And now here in 35, we have Moses standing in front of the people saying, this is what God said for us to do. Got that? So this is not another part. This is the natural part. This is what the leadership under God does as he goes on the mountain and gets alone with God and then stands in front of the people of God and says, thus saith the Lord God Almighty. How many of you believe that to be true? That's the way that it works. But then those that he speaks to have been given by God some supernatural, I'll call it ability, uh, and opportunity to use the work. So it says this, that he did all that. Verse 1, Moses says this also, six days shall work be done, and on the seventh uh, day there shall be no, uh, shall be to you an holy uh, day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to uh, death, and ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. So let me make sure you understand this that God is saying to them not only do I have a way but I have a place I have a time uh, for rest in your life uh, even as you work so don't think that you can build the temple and ignore or the tabernacle and ignore the other things that I said while building the tabernacle you have to honor the Sabbath that I put in place you have to obey God you have to live life God's way in order to bring glory to God. But then he begins to talk about those who are overseers or, or craftsmen in this. And, it, and uh, verse number uh, five, he talks about taking an offering from all of them. And, uh, and they're all doing their part. And we saw earlier that he'd called Bezalel, an overseer and teacher of the craftsmen, And he called a man by the name of Aholiab in verse number six back in chapter 31. And he says, listen, these are men. But it also says, and many craftsmen and women. So I want you to understand this, that there was a leader. A leader gave the instructions and ultimately he gave it to people who'd been given by God the ability to do this work. And while there are a couple called out by name, why? Because they also help lead and teach. But there was a whole congregation of people who were putting their shoulder to this work. Work, both in the giving of the offering and in the doing of the work there were people who just did the work and so listen simple I don't want to make it complicated the way that they got to the place in chapter 40 where God manifest his glory in that tabernacle is they began with the leadership and following the leadership and they each took their place under that leadership following God as he followed God and they began to execute the gifts and talents and abilities that God had given them is everybody with me here? Now, this is pretty simple. Let me tell you what it sounds like. See if I can. Someone tell me what this sounds like somewhere else in Scripture. Does it sound like any other? This is Israel. Does it sound like any other institution of God in Scripture? Say it out loud. Thank you. Because what happens in the church? God has particular offices of leadership, not superiority, just leadership, servant leadership. And then he's given, the Bible says, to every believer in that body a supernatural ability or a spiritual gift. And the purpose is to profit the whole body, Ephesians chapter 4, so that in that body God would get glory. This glory principle and the way we get to the manifestation of God's glory 
is no different today, really, than it was then. Now, we're not building a tent. But God through us is trying to build a church and reach the world with the gospel. And so there are always these parts, leadership under God, and then there are those who God has enabled, and therefore I'll use the term called, to do the work of that ministry. Now who are those people today? Okay, go like this. You ready? Come on. Higher, higher, more, all. They're us. They're y'all. They're me. I have my role. You have your role. We fill our roles together. We're a family. We're a flock. We're a church. We're a body. And just like here, where God had people that he had supernaturally enabled, we have people in this church that God has given spiritual gifts to who have some talents. Uh, we have some people that do carpentry and electrical work and, and plumbing. You say, preacher, you think they're spiritual gifts? No, I don't. I believe they're talents. Let me tell you the difference. Lost people that don't know Jesus can also be good plumbers and electricians and, and uh, carpenters, can't they? What do these people have? Well, they have a servant's heart given to them by the Lord. They have a spiritual gift where they're serving for the profit of the body to the glory of God. And every one of us, every believer, the Bible says, has that gift. And so we have the same thing, that, that there's leadership under God, there's supernatural ability and special uh, calling, if you will, from God to serve in a particular way. And so they did that and they began to build according to the instructions of God. This is very simple, right? That they just got the instructions from God, Moses. Moses took them to the people and he said, here's what we need to do. We need to put together some resources that God's gonna provide through you all and through us. And then we need to each take our place that's willing to do that and begin to put their shoulder to the wheel, executing the ability that God has given them so that they can build this house unto the Lord that God might manifest his glory through us. But here, it's very simple. And they do all of that. And if we believe the instructions that they were given, and I do, it was a pretty spectacular place for a tent. This might be the first, in, uh, uh, the first uh, occasion of glamping in all of the world. Now, nobody slept in there, but this was spectacular. It was bright and beautiful in color. It was precise in, in its put together and in its purpose. And from it, day and night emanated the glory of God. The cloud by day and the fire by night. It's pretty spectacular. So we have a leadership and we have a workman, but there's one thing missing. What's missing, church? We have uh, someone to have the plan from God and someone to do, and some ones, all of us, to do the pieces. What's missing to bring glory to God? You're right. What's missing in the workers that we haven't seen yet? Heart. Remember this. We had the Phillips and the Butkeys play music this morning. We had the Henry sing music this morning. And if you're critical of either one of them, you should just get your heart right because here's what they did. They gave that to God. Do you know why they were up here? Does anybody have any idea why the Butkeys and the Phillips, some of the Phillips were up here and why the Henrys were up here singing in front of you? In fact, how many of you think it's hard to sing in front of people? Very few. Everyone with their hand down, here's your opportunity. Give me a cordless mic and see who wants to sing. They're not up there because it's easy. And check this out. The amount of money we pay them is zero. In fact, we expect them to give money. Well, we don't. God does. You know why they're up there? Because they're willing and they desire. It's about the heart. We could hire piano players. We don't. They sound like they should be hireable, but we pay them the same amount we did the singers this morning. They play so God gets the glory. They're taking those things under leadership 
and they're using them for the good of the body. They're filling their role and they're desiring that through this. Listen, if they're up there so you, uh, so you applaud for them, if that's why they're there, you and I might not ever know that, but God does and they've already got their reward. But I'm telling you this, that these things are being done because it's necessary, not just talent, not just ability, but that we would have the right heart before God, before God's glory would ever be manifest in our life. This is the part I want you to get. We'll take three or four or 12 minutes to do it, but, but please listen to me. We see it greatly in chapter 35 and 36, and it describes in three different terms the condition of the people's hearts. And so here's the first one, chapter 35 and verse five. It says, take from among you an offering unto the Lord whosoever is of listen to the phrase a willing heart the first condition of heart that was needed in these people before they ever got to the glory in chapter 40 is that they had to have a willing heart well what is a willing heart preacher well I don't think I really need to tell you I think you don't uh, I don't I think you already know what that is it's someone who's desires who's noble who's liberal who's uh, who uh, is uh, generous with the gifts and abilities that God has given them that they might with us bring glory to God it's just a willing heart they say this there's an opportunity to serve God with what he gave me I'm in for that why because it's a willing heart everybody got this this is really simple you're looking at me this morning like uh, you're not getting this you understand this right that they have a willing heart why why do you think uh, there are people standing at the back door greeting you or people that came up during the week and cleaned off snow or will in there and uh, i mean working until on um, the electrical stuff until he can't stand up and we about had to take him out in a wheelchair one day i think but why do you think he does that we're paying him a great deal of money too just so you know the electrician tell him will how much are we paying you oh that's right i forgot about that <laughs> willing heart Before there will ever be glory to God from our life, we have to examine what's going on inside of us. And not saying, if it goes my way, I'll do it. But saying, it's what God said, and I'm willing and submitted to Him. Here's the second thing about the heart that we see very quickly this morning. In chapter 35, if you uh, skim down uh, just a little bit. But we not only see a willing heart but we see a heart that's available and empowered. Verse 10 of chapter 35, the Bible says this, and every wise-hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. Verse 25 says something like that. It says this in verse 25, and all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands. Well, where does wisdom come from? Someone tell me. Yeah, there is a wisdom of the world, the Bible says, and that it's foolishness to God. The wisdom that matters that enables us to do the things in life and to live the lives that bring glory to God comes from the Lord. And they're wise-hearted because they're humble before the Lord. God resisteth the proud, James writes, but gives grace to the humble. And the way you and I find wisdom an ability to serve him in ways that we would be afraid to do and have no ability to do is by being humble and available or wise-hearted, humble and available to God. And then there's one more thing about the heart. And if you look again in, uh, with me in uh, uh, verse uh, number uh, 21 of chapter 35, the Bible says this, and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and the phrase is repeated a number of times uh, throughout this, that whose heart stirred them up. Verse 26 says this, and all of the women whose heart stirred them up. Verse uh, number two of chapter 36, just down the few verses, says this, and Moses called Bezalel and, ah and Aholiab and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. The third part, we have a wise-hearted, right? We have a, a willing-hearted, available, wise-hearted, right? Humble uh, and uh, uh, surrender to God. And then we have this, uh, this one whose heart stirred them up. Now, please get this. It doesn't say they stirred up their hearts. Do you see that? It says their heart or their inner man stirred them up. And literally, they were being driven by the motive of love 
and passion for God. The inward man caused the work to come from them. Their heart, inward man, stirred them up to do the work. And it was a heart of passion, love, and desire for God. And so when you take a people that are God's people and you give them leadership under God, and I'll just say this to everybody that's in leadership, whatever that role is with the children and the ushers, wherever it is, that leadership here will will never be kept in its place that's not leadership under God. Because when leadership becomes over God, it begins to block the glory from God, doesn't it? And then a people who God has given gifts to, abilities and resources in their life, that they can now use for the purpose of God's program, the manifestation, the building of the temple or the tabernacle here. And those people having willing, right, surrendered, humble hearts, driven by love for God, sacrificed their stuff to go and do God's stuff and considered it no sacrifice at all. And what was the result? They finished the work according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. And the glory of God, the brightness, the majesty, the abundance, the dignity was so thick in that place that anyone around could see that through their lives, God was not only present, but he was being magnified. He was being served. He was being honored so that his glory was the distinguishing mark of the camp of the people of Israel and nothing else. The only thing that mattered was those are the people where the glory of God exudes day and night. Simple, right? All right, one more quick thing. What does this have to do with missions? We're here about missions. Today, in a little while, you'll get a faith promise card. We'll probably do this uh, after the meal. If you're leaving, please get one and, and we'll, we'll make sure you get them out. And I'm gonna ask you to make a commitment to missions. We've been talking about it. We'll talk some more about it. But what does this glory have to do with missions? I know that usually, and we haven't done any of this this month and we haven't done it on purpose, that a lot of times when we uh, look at missions and a missions program, we like to put pictures in front of you or have people come and tell you about how terrible things are where they live. And they are terrible and there's a lot of need in this world, but that's not why we do missions. You you listen to me today that what we're going to ask you to commit, we talked last week about how we get the faith, you know, that we give of our abundance and sacrifice and trusting God and following God and we get to a faith promise amount. Listen, we're not asking you to do any of that. Really, God's not asking you to do that simply because of need. Please get this straight. Missions is not first about need. There are needs involved. Missions is not about need. Say that with me. Missions is not about need. There's no end of need. No matter where you turn, there's need. I would even tell you this, there's need in this room. Do you understand that if we begin to try to do the work of God and it's about need, it's about the need of those people over there, those people over there, those needs matter, but that's not what we do this work for. It can't be about need. Why? Why can't it be about need? Someone tell me. It's true. Yeah, and check this out. You're both right. But when their need and our need switch places, we stop doing the work if it's based on need. When my need, either really or in perception, outweighs their need in my mind, I'm no longer committed to this. What we do for Christ cannot be simply about need. We're not overlooking needs. We certainly want to meet needs But meeting needs is not the motive. It's not why we do this. Everybody get this? Because if it is, it doesn't last beyond our own hardships. So what is it about? 
If it's not about need, if missions and missions, giving and going out on visitation and, and uh, you know, just all the things we do to try to reach people in the community, if it's not about need and while there is real need, if it's not about that, then what in the world is it about, preacher? Anybody want to take a guess? He commands it. It's about this thing here. Glory. God's glory. Of course, the commandment has to be followed, doesn't it? We just saw that. It's about God's glory. No, 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 hear me. We're, we're just all but done. But you've got to get this. That we are going to ask you to fill out a card, and, and for many of us, that's going to be a number that, that we have to walk by faith, because that is really what faith promise is. And I'm not asking you to do that. That's going to be a number that, that you're going to decide to make some sacrifice in. And it's about glory. All of it is about God's glory. It's never about the need. It's about God getting glory through the work he does and that Jesus is the inheritor of those for which he died. Let me read you a quick story and we'll move on. It's part of a message It's a message preached years and years ago by a man by the name of Paris Reedhead. You can find the whole message on the internet and listen to it if you desire. I would encourage you to, in fact. The title of the message is Ten Shekels in a Shirt. And it comes out of a story of Micaiah in in the Bible. And Paris Reedhead, believing that he was doing the justice work of God, went to Africa as a missionary. And what I'm going to read to you right now is what goes on in his life, just a couple of minutes, while he's a missionary in Africa. Listen to his testimony. He starts out by saying this, now I ask you what is the philosophy of missions, what is the philosophy of evangelism, what is the philosophy of Christian, a Christian? If you ask me why why I went to Africa, I will tell you I went primarily to improve upon the justice of God. I didn't think it was right for anybody to go to hell without a chance to be saved. So I went to give poor sinners a chance to go to heaven. Now I haven't put it in so many words, but if you'll analyze what I just told you, do you know what it is? Humanism. That I was simply using the provisions of Jesus Christ as a means to improve upon human conditions of suffering and misery. And when I went to Africa, I discovered that they weren't poor, ignorant, little heathen running around in the woods looking for someone to tell them how to go to heaven, that they were monsters of iniquity. They were living in utter and total defiance of far more knowledge of God than I ever dreamed they had. They deserved to be condemned to hell because they utterly refused to walk in the light of their conscience and the light of the law written upon their heart, and the testimony of nature, and the truth they knew. And when I found, out, found that out, I assure you, I was so angry with God that on one occasion in prayer, I told him that it was a mighty little thing he'd done sending me out there to reach these people that were waiting to be told how to go to heaven. And when I got there, I found out they knew about heaven, and they didn't want to go there, and that they loved their sin, and they wanted to stay in it. I went out there motivated by humanism. I'd seen pictures of lepers and pictures of ulcers. I'd seen pictures of native funerals. I didn't want my fellow human beings to suffer in hell eternally after such a miserable existence on earth. But it was over there in Africa that God began to tear through the overlay of humanism. And it was that day in my bedroom with the door locked that I wrestled with God. For here was I coming to grips with the fact that the people I thought were ignorant and wanted to know how to go to heaven were saying and were saying someone come teach us actually didn't want to talk take the time uh, to talk with me or anybody else. They had no interest in the Bible, no interest in Christ, and they loved their sin and wanted to continue in it. And I was uh, to that place at that time where I felt that the whole thing was a sham and a mockery and I had been sold a bill of goods and I wanted to come home. there alone in my bedroom as I faced God honestly with my heart with what my heart felt it seemed to me that I heard him say yes will not the judge of all the earth do right the heathen are lost they are going to go to hell not because they haven't heard the gospel 
They're going to go to hell because they're sinners who love their sin because they deserve hell. But I didn't send you out there for them. I didn't send you out there for their sakes. I heard as clearly as I've ever heard, though it wasn't with a physical voice. But it was the echo of truth of the ages finding its way into an open heart. And I heard God say to my heart that day something like this, I did not send you to Africa for the sake of the heathen. I sent you to Africa for my sake. They deserved hell, but I love them. And I endured the agonies of hell for them. I didn't send you out there for them. I sent you out there for me. Do I not deserve the reward of my suffering? Do I not deserve those for whom I died? It was not for the sake of the heathen. It wasn't need. I was there, but for a Savior who endured the agonies of hell for me. But he deserved the heathen because he died for them. My eyes were open. I was no longer working for Micah and ten shekels in a shirt, but I was serving a living God. Do you see? Let me summarize. Christianity says the end of all being is the glory of God. Humanism says the end of all being is the happiness of man. One of those philosophies born in hell, the deification of man, and the other was born in heaven, the glorification of God. One is a Levite serving Micaiah, and the other is a heart that's unworthy serving the living God because it's the highest honor in the universe. Missions is about the glory of God. It's about Jesus receiving those for whom he died on Calvary. Do we meet needs? Yes. Do we go because of needs primarily? No. We go, we give, we send for the glory of God. And when today you fill out one of these cards, and I pray that you've sought the Lord in prayer and you've considered it, and you fill it out, I want you to remember that we're not doing this because there are poor, starving people around the world. We want to meet those needs. But we are doing this for the glory of God by doing the work He commanded and reaching them with the gospel so that He might, He might receive what He died for and all that He died for. And that's what we do. Listen, Christian, do you know why we live the way we live? so that he might receive what he's worthy of. Do you know why we give what we give? So that he might receive. Do you know why we tell people about Jesus and put ourselves out there sometimes in places that get uncomfortable? That he might receive what he's worthy of. And you know what we're gonna do as a church, I trust? And that is make a commitment that might cost us, but that causes him to receive what he's worthy of. We do all of this for the glory of God. Hey, listen, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, can I tell you we'd like to see this place filled with the glory of God today? If you're here, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we would invite you to come and let us help you. And someone would take a Bible and show you how Jesus can be your Savior. Can I tell you what would happen? Glory will come down and fill you today, amen? And you'll have a new life in Christ. And he'll begin from your life to receive what he died for on Calvary. I'm going to have a word of prayer with you. We do have to get the faith promise today. We're going to do it at the end of our meal. If you're done, uh, if you're not able to stay for the meal, please get a faith promise card and I'll give you any instruction you need. We invite everyone to stay, visitors or otherwise. We have too much food, we'll eat it all. But today, Christian, before you give your faith promise commitment, would you take this minute as the piano will begin to play in just a second? Would you take this minute and commit your life not to meeting needs, but to seeking through all you do the glory of God? Maybe pray something like this, Christian. God, today I realize that much of the glory from my life has come to me But I desire and submit that all from my life would bring glory to you. The piano is going to begin to play. I'm going to have you stand with me. And um, I'm going to have a word of prayer with you. 
And as a piano plays, Christian, I want to encourage you, maybe bow before your God. Maybe with your husband and wife, consider in prayer what you do later today for faith promise. Or just give your house and your home and your lives to Him for His glory. If you're not here today, if you're here today and don't know Christ, please, as the piano begins to play and people are praying around the room with heads bowed and eyes closed, please do this. Please just walk up here and say, Preacher, I need to know Jesus. I want to know the Jesus who gave Himself for me. And somebody will take a Bible and help you today. Become a follower and believer in Jesus Christ, washed in the blood, born again. Father, I pray you'd help us. I know it's been kind of a long message and lots of pieces. But the simple truth is, is that we do what we do for the glory of you and your dear son. And you get that glory in the greatest amount.